Hello and welcome to this lecture in the course for Secure Systems Engineering. Uh, in the previous lectures, we had been looking at uh, cache timing attacks. We had looked at the cache cover channel um, first and then we actually in the later video, we had looked at uh, the uh, flush plus reload attack. In this uh, lecture, we will be looking at another cache timing attack known as cache collision attacks. So essentially, there are two types of cache collision attacks. They are external cache collision attacks and internal cache collision attacks. Uh, so external cache collision attacks are popularly known as prime and probe attacks, while internal collision attacks are known as time driven attacks. So uh, in this lecture, we will first start with uh, a prime and probe attack and then we will look at a time driven attack. In a prime and probe attack, the uh, scenario we are considering is either this or this. Uh, we have a victim process uh, running in a particular core and a spy process running in an other processor core. So both the victim and spy are sharing the same cache memory. So in this particular example, we have the last level cache memory uh, shared between uh, the victim process and the spy process. In this setup, on the other hand, we have both the victim and the spy running on the same processor core. The assumption over here is that this particular processor core is a symmetrically multi-threaded processor core or in other words, uh, when using the Intel's uh, nomenclature, this processor core is a hyper-threaded processor core. So, given this particular scenario, we have the victim and the spy running simultaneously and sharing the common L1 cache memory. As we have seen before, uh, the cache memories could be uh, very abstractly represented by this particular figure. So, it, over here we have uh, rows corresponding to each set in that particular cache memory. So, here for example, we have n cache sets going from set 0 to set n and each set has 4 ways, way 0 to way 3. So, depending on the address uh, that is accessed by the victim or the spy process. So, one particular cache line in a particular set is used to store the victim and the spy data. Now, what we will see in this lecture is that in a prime and probe attack uh, in situations such as this, it is possible for the spy process to gain some information about the victim process. So, this attack uh, has been used uh, very famously retrieve uh, secret trees from a victim process which is executing a cryptographic algorithm. The prime phase looks uh, something like this. So, uh, it, there is an infinite loop. Uh, in the spy process and for each cache set, the spy process creates certain load instructions which accesses all the ways of that particular cache set. While this is done, the spy also times these load instructions. So, the timing is done by uh, this function where initially we invoke a clock source and get the starting time and then after accessing all the cache ways and loading all the spy data into the cache, uh, then we invoke the timer again and get the end time. Now, the access time is given by end minus start. So, once this is done uh, for all the cache sets, what would result at the end of this for loop is that the entire cache is filled with spy data. So, spy is continuously doing this and as a result, the entire cache is filled with the spy data. Next, what happens is that the spy process waits for some time. The next what happens is that the spy process waits for some time and is essentially waiting for the victim process to begin execution. Now, the victim process during its execution uh, would start to access certain instructions. Now, when the victim executes, there will be certain uh, sets in the cache memory where the spy data would be evicted and replaced with the victim data. Cache memory would typically 
implement some replacement policy such as the least recently used and identify a particular uh, cache line to evict and that particular cache line is replaced with the victim data. Let us consider what would happen when uh, the victim executes again. So after waiting for some time, the victim enters the probe phase. So in the probe phase, which is again this uh, for loop being executed, the victim would start to access every cache set and in the probe phase, the victim would pass through every cache set and access all the cache lines present in that particular set. And, and at that time, it would also measure the time required to make these accesses. Now, if we actually look at this and uh, try to infer what the spy sees, uh, it, we would see that when the spy accesses this set, that is a set 0, uh, the time taken would be less because the contents of set 0 corresponds to all spy data and therefore the spy would only incur cache hits and as a result the access time for set 0 would be low. Now the access time for set 1, 2, 3 and uh, n minus 2 would be high. The result is that the spy would incur certain cache misses and the cache misses are incurred because the spy data has been evicted and replaced with the victim data and uh, during the probe phase there would be further cache misses incurred uh, by the spy process in these sets uh, specifically sets 1, 2, 3 and n minus 2. In this way the spy process would be able to identify the cache sets which have victim data or in other words the spy process would be able to identify the cache sets which the victim has accessed. As a result of the probe phase, victim data which was present in the cache gets evicted out and replaced again with the spy process. And this prime and probe phase gets continues over and over again as we see over here. So this particular plot shows the time obtained for the probe phase. So each row over here corresponds to uh, one particular iteration in uh, the spy process and each column corresponds to a particular set. So for example, this was run on an Intel uh, i7 machine which had an L1 cache uh, with 64 cache sets. So each column over here corresponds uh, to a particular cache set. Now a lighter color would indicate that the execution time measured was low. In other words, a lighter color would indicate that the spy process in that particular iteration had uh, observed cache hits. On the other hand, a darker color such as these over here would indicate that uh, the execution time was higher in which case the spy process has incurred cache misses. So uh, we can actually clearly see that there are some cache sets where clearly cache misses are always observed. For example, looking at this particular plot, we can actually infer the sets which had incurred a high execution time. For example, uh, all the darker cache sets like these over here uh, have a higher execution time indicating that the spy process has incurred a lot of cache misses. On the other hand, the lighter shades like uh, this cache set and so on have incurred a lot of cache hits and therefore are a lighter shade. In this particular way, uh, by tracing the how the cache memories have been accessed would get an indication of what the other process is doing. So uh, another example is uh, these regions at this particular point which are considerably darker. So uh, this regions would mean that there is some activity for example uh, uh, another process that was getting context switched or something like that which has been executing and performing a lot of uh, memory operations and thus we see that it has affected the spy process. So now we would see how we could use this prime and probe scheme to retrieve the secret key in um, a particular decryption algorithm. Let us say we have a function uh, which looks something like this. So the function is called receive decrypt uh, and it takes a particular socket 
and uh, over here we define a secret key which has a value of 12. Now uh, what we do is we uh, read the ciphertext from that socket and uh, this ciphertext is stored uh, is just a character uh, which is stored in CT. Now there is a lookup on this particular uh, array uh, with containing some, um, some character values which we have not specified over here. Uh, and uh, the lookup is based on an index which is key XOR ciphertext. This operation is used to obtain the plain text which is then returned. Now this is just a, a toy decryption algorithm which we have just built up to show how prime and probe can be used to break cryptographic schemes. The important point for us to observe over here is that this lookup to this particular array uh, is on a address location which is key dependent. So uh, for example, uh, assuming that the attacker knows the value of the ciphertext, index of this particular lookup would depend on the value of the key. So for example, if uh, let us say uh, the, uh, the ciphertext had, has a value say 0 x uh, f f, if the key value was 0, lookup is to the location 0 x f f. On the other hand, if the key had the value uh, 0 x a a, then the lookup is to a location 0 x 5 5. Uh, thus you see that this lookup operation over here is essentially a memory access, right. The, this memory access is going to load a different data in the cache memory. Now assume that we are actually running this particular process and this is our victim process and side by side we also run the spy process which is continuously. Uh, running the prime and probe, scanning the, uh, measuring the time taken to make memory accesses to a uh, different sets in the cache. Now if the key is uh, 0xAA and the attacker knows that the cipher text is 0xFF, then corresponding to this lookup plus 0x55, the spy process would see an increased number of cache misses. So, this would be observed by an increase in the execution time for that iteration uh, in the spy process and thus the attacker can infer that the victim process has accessed that portion of memory and from that could infer that the key value is either 0xAA or something very close to 0xAA. Besides cryptography, the prime and probe type of attack have been used for uh, a larger number of different applications. One other famous application is for uh, keyboard sniffing. So this particular process is the victim process. Now you have the other process which is our uh, the attack process which is doing the prime and pro probe operations. So whenever there is a keystroke that is whenever a user presses a key for example let us say he is pressing a key with respect to his password, uh, each keystroke results in an interrupt the interrupt results in a switch to kernel mode, uh, there is an ISR that gets executed and so on. So each keystroke results in a lot of execution uh, that takes place. So whenever a keystroke is pressed, it results in a lot of different uh, functions uh, both in the operating system and both in the victim application that gets executed. As a result, we would have a lot of the spy data which is running the pry band probe to be evicted from the cache. Thus the attacker would be able to identify the instant at which uh, the keys on the keyboard were pressed. This is a plot from a recent paper which is shown here and what we see over here is the delay in, um, in clock cycles and over time. So we see that as keys are being pressed, what the prime and probe applica uh, application sees is that there is an increase in, execu uh, in execution time during a particular phase. So for example, when no keys are pressed, the execution time uh, which is measured by the spy process is low and when a particular key is pressed, then we see an increase in the execution time as you see in these instances. Again after some time, 
uh, when there is no key press, the, the spy does not see an increase in the execution time. There are of course a lot of errors which may also creep up, like for example this over here, which shows an increase in execution time even though no keys have been pressed. So the prime and probe attack has also been used in various other use cases. Uh, especially it has been used to create to attack JavaScript, native client and web assembly on uh, web browsers uh, such as the Google Chrome uh, and Firefox. So what uh, this particular slide is taken from uh, this uh, paper over here which is known as the drive by cache and uh, it actually showed how uh, the Gmail secret key can be retrieved. Uh, by using a prime and probe attack. So what would typically happen is that the user is made to go to a particular link and click on a particular advertising website and this website uh, would open a tab which is an advertisement tab and maybe show display an advertisement but also in the background it would be running the prime and probe attack. So whenever there is uh, an encryption or decryption that takes place the prime and probe would, would measure the activities on the cache memory and use that timing to infer secret information. Another famous application of the prime and probe attack uh, was is for website fingerprinting where the prime and probe application can identify what websites are being browsed. Another very famous attack uh, which was first presented in this particular paper uh, by Rice and Part in uh, 2009 determines how cross virtual machine attacks can be done using something like the prime and probe attack. Here we are using a cloud environment which have different virtual machines but the underlying hardware is the same. For example in this figure over here we would have an attacker sharing the same cache memory as a victim process. Thus the attacker runs a prime and probe application and is able to monitor the cache and memory activity by the victim process. And from this it would be able to identify secret information like cryptographic keys, it could uh, identify what has what characters have been pressed, uh, it could be able to sniff keystrokes and so on. Very recently a very similar type of attack was also showed using a shared DRAM in such an case the victim and the attacker uh, do not have to share the same LLC but have to share a common DRAM. So now we look at internal collision attacks or properly known, known as time driven attacks. Here uh, the scenario looks very different. Here what happens is that the victim and the attacker not, may not necessarily share the same computing resource or uh, may not necessarily share the same cache memory. Okay, so we will now look at uh, internal collision attacks. These are popularly known as time di driven attacks. So in such a scenario, we have uh, an attacker who is able to invoke a victim application and is able to measure the time taken for the victim to provide a, a response. So in other words, the attacker would send a request to the victim process, which may be in a completely different machine. And then it uh, measures the time taken for the response to be obtained. The differences uh, in execution time that is measured at the attacker's end is then used to obtain some sensitive information about the victim. So uh, these time driven attacks are especially popular for uh, breaking cryptographic algorithms and we will take one very simple example of this scheme. So let us say that we have a small part of the cipher which looks something like this. We have a plain text P0 and a plain text P4 which is the input to the cipher. Now these inputs each are of let us say a byte wide gets XORed with keys K0 and K4 respectively. Thus we get P0 XOR K0 at one side and P4 XOR K4 on the other side. Now this P0 XOR K0 and P4 XOR K4 is then used to index into a table. So there is a lookup in this table uh, based on this particular index. Now let us see what happens when we execute this particular program. So first of all we have the attacker over here 
and we will assume that the attacker is able to choose the values of P0 and P4 as required. So the attacker chooses P0, P4 and triggers an encryption to occur. So during the encryption, these operations take place and then the attacker uh, measures the, the time for this entire encryption. Now we will see how this execution time can vary depending on the values of K0 and K4. So first let us assume that uh, the cache is clean and no part of the cache comprises contains any of this table information. So during the first access at the location P0 XOR K0 that would result in a cache miss and one block of memory would get loaded into the cache. The second access at the index P4 XOR K4 could either result in a cache hit or a cache miss. A cache hit is incurred when uh, the index P4 XOR K4 exactly collides or is very close to this value of P0 XOR K0. In such a case, it would indicate that this second access is to the same or to a neighboring location as the first access. Since this data is already present in the cache, therefore we obtain a cache hit and the execution time for this second access would be considerably smaller. On the other hand, if uh, P0 XOR K0 is not equal to P4 XOR K4, then uh, the second access would also result in a cache miss. Second access would also require a memory block to be loaded into that particular cache. To evaluate the entire execution time, we see that we either get one cache miss and one cache hit or two cache misses. And thus we see depending on the value of P0 XOR K0, K0 and P4 XOR K4, the execution time of this particular uh, cipher would vary. So based on this variation, we can obtain some information about the secret keys. Specifically, if we have a cache hit, then we obtain uh, this relation that P0 XOR K0 is equal to P4 XOR K4 and if we just rearrange the terms, we get K0 XOR K4 is equal to P0 XOR P4. Now since the attacker knows P0 XOR P4, he thus knows the XOR of K0 XOR K4. So how does this help the attacker? Suppose we assume that each uh, key K0 and K4 is of 8 bits. Therefore, before running or without running this particular attack, uh, the uncertainty of the attacker is 8 plus 8 that is 16 bits. Now after running the attacker, if the attacker identifies this cache hit and obtains a relation like this, this uncertainty reduces from 16 bits to 8 bits. Now all that is required is the attacker uh, identifies any one of them that is let us say he identifies K0 and using that K0 he can easily identify what K4 is using this relationship. Similarly, if there is a cache miss then a relation such as this is obtained and it would mean that P0 XOR K0 is not equal to P4 XOR K4 uh, which means that the index accessed by this in this access and this access are not the same and they, therefore K0 XOR K4 is not equal to P0 XOR P4. So this was a toy example and such an example could be extended to a complete cipher. So in a complete cipher such as uh, an AES cipher, uh, a very small part of this entire block cipher it is having a structure as we have seen before. So for example, if you consider AES, an AES comprises of 16 bytes of input and it would give you 16 bytes of output. And there are several operations which are uh, actually going on inside the AES block cipher out of which the operations that we were actually interested in uh, looks uh, something like this and is a very small component of the entire cipher. So the way we actually extend the attack that we have seen to a complete block cipher is as follows. So we keep P0 a, a constant and keep changing uh, the values of P4. So in this particular case, uh, we have uh, let us say taken uh, the K0 to be 0, K4 to be 50. 
let us assume that this is our secret information. Now, we uh, keep the value of p naught as constant and for each different value of p 4, we change uh, the remaining inputs randomly. So, let us say we change uh, for over like 2 power 16 different values of uh, this data for a specific value of p 4. We measure the execution time required for the cipher like AES to encrypt that particular plain text using its secret key. After we do this, we find the average time uh, for each value of p 4. So, for example, we have uh, 16 different values of p 4 starting from 00, 10, 20, 30, all of these are hexadecimal values and uh, it would end up in f 0. For each value of p 4, we would uh, compute the average time that is obtained when all of the other input values are varied randomly for over like say a large number of times say uh, 2 power 16 or so. What we notice is that when the value of p 4 becomes 50, we obtain the highest deviation from the mean. So, the mean over here is uh, 2943.57 and the maximum deviation from this particular mean is obtained when the value of p 4 is 50. And in this case, uh, we, we consider the absolute value of uh, the difference of mean which is and therefore, it should be 6.3. So, from this what we can see is that p naught we have set to 0, p 4 we have obtained to 50. So, p naught x or p 4 is uh, equal to 50. So, thus we can infer that k 0 x or k 4 would be equal to 50. And if we go back to uh, what we have kept the values of these keys, we have k 0 and k 4 is 50 and thus we see it matches the results that we obtain. So, in this way we had uh, looked at uh, cache collision attacks. We had looked at uh, collision attacks which are external which requires a spy process to execute in the same system as the victim process and also share the same cache memory as the victim. We also looked at internal collision attacks where an attacker need not run a spy process, it could only trigger the victim program to execute and measure the amount of time it took for that particular victim to execute. And based on this time, uh, the attacker would be able to infer secret information about that victim process. Thank you.